Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Chappelle and thank you very much for taking the time to watch my Protein Nutrition for Sport um, lecture. So this particular lecture, I'm going to talk about a number of different things um, to do with protein and hopefully it's going to clear up a number of the misconceptions that many people have around protein nutrition for sport and particularly for body composition and for body composition changes. Now, I am a doctor of nutrition, that's what my PhD is, in, and I'm also head coach at Pro Prep Coaching as well. I work with a wide variety of athletes, so chiefly bodybuilders amongst them, but I've also got experience working with strong men, powerlifters, triathletes, professional rugby players, and of course, marathon runners eh, as well. If you find this lecture enjoyable and you find the information on here, useful then be sure to check out the rest of my content i've got lots of stuff on my pro prep website that's www.proprepcoaching.com also check out the articles that i've got on the, the website check out the youtube and be sure to check out my instagram as well there's lots of educational videos on there too and of course if you like all this don't be afraid to to hit me up get in touch with me and let me know what your goals are maybe i can help you now it's important to say um, coming into this, that knowledge is power. And utilizing these strategies will help you build more muscle, help you retain more muscle during a calorie deficit, a very important thing when you're trying to, to lose weight. That will consequently help you burn more fat because you've got an increase in your overall muscle mass while your fat mass has gone down. It will help improve your power and strength because the more muscle you've got, then the uh, the more stronger and the powerful you are. And it will enhance your athletic performance as well. So if you utilize these strategies, they, um, they will help you. Now, I've utilized these strategies many times before. These are just some of my athletes that took part in the 2021 bodybuilding season. I don't think anyone worked with more athletes than myself throughout the, uh, the UK and my partner at Pro Prep Coaching up here. Uh, Stephanie Noble, another pro bodybuilder her, uh, herself. So these athletes are athletes who took part at the, the World Championships. You'll note a couple of them have had pro card wins. And you can see I work with females, males, and different divisions uh, across the board as well. And I'm sure you'll agree everyone's in fantastic shape here as well. And this all comes down to utilizing the strategies that I mentioned on the uh, the previous page. Now, although knowledge is power, it's not enough just to, to know the knowledge. You actually have to know how to implement it and how to... Um, put it alongside a, a proper training and nutritional programming. So that's where the, the coach comes in and helps guide these people along the way. It's not just a case of book smarts. We need to have the, the practical experience as um, as well. Moving on from here, what is it that we're actually going to learn today? Well, I'm going to talk about the protein requirements for sport. I'm going to talk about the functions and structure of protein, sources of protein and quality, the distribution and eating patterns of protein, and then I'm going to talk about a little summary on here. And I'm going to come in straight with the protein requirements of sport right from the off, and then you'll hopefully be able to see how these other factors that I've got to mention in this uh, short seminar relate to this as well. So, if you go on to the GISSN website, so this is the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, or if you visit something like the IOC, International Olympic Committee, or the American College of Sports Medicine, you can find these guidelines. Uh, and these guidelines are based on the, the latest scientific data. There are some slight deviations between the, uh, the different bodies. Um, some of that comes down to different classifications. So, for example, the American College of Sports Medicine likes to talk in terms of uh, endurance sport or strength and power sports, like powerlifting and... Um, strength athletics or it likes to talk about mixed sports like stop start sports like rugby um, tennis football things like that so th there are slight differences but overall and across the board this is what you're going to see if you go on any of these websites now when it comes to protein requirements they're often expressed you can see here in terms of grams per kilogram of body weight and on the right hand side of this table i've given you a protein requirement for say a 70 kilogram individual at 12% body fat and a 90 kilogram individual at 12% body fat and, and what that actually looks like in real terms. Now a common thing that people come up against is how much protein, well it does depend on your size because you can see if you're larger you need a little bit more, if you're less then you need a little bit less. Um, now if you're watching this seminar then you're definitely probably someone who's not a sedentary individual 
or probably someone who's not an elderly individual either and you're interested in how you can improve your performance. So protein requirements are very broad and that's to do with the different types of sports that people do. But generally speaking, requirements are probably somewhere in the region of 1.2 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. And if you're unsure where to how much protein to eat, then you're probably better off going at the upper end of the scale rather than the lower end of the scale, just in case to make sure that you get sufficient protein in your diet to help you meet your uh, meet your needs, such as your muscle building goals, for example. One thing is for sure that when people are on weight loss diets, that a higher protein uh, intake certainly makes a difference in terms of muscle preservation. And as we lose weight, we very often lose muscle mass while we're losing fat mass. So it's very important that you have enough protein in your diet to prevent that from, uh, from happening. When it comes to competitive bodybuilding preparation, um, we can often express the protein requirements in terms of fat-free mass. So that's your fat mass removed from your body and just the amount of protein that's left for non-fatty tissue. And you can see those requirements can end up being slightly higher than that of uh, general populations. But good rule of thumb is somewhere in the region around about two grams per kilogram of body weight is probably what you need. So that's about 140 kilograms for a 70 kilogram individual or 180 kilograms for, sorry, 180 grams for someone who's a 90 kilogram individual. At the absolute top end, just shy of 250 grams and at the lower end or rather on the top end for a 70 kilogram individual that works out about 191 grams so those are your protein requirements and um, if you go and have a look that's how much you need and um, now an important concept and protein requirements is this idea about muscle protein synthesis so what we mean by muscle protein synthesis is when we tell our body to uh, make new protein so if we tell our body to make new protein, then we accumulate protein tissues and that increases, if we're looking at muscle mass, the overall muscle size that we're looking at. Um, there's a common thing that people will talk about in terms of muscle protein synthesis is the amount of protein required to maximally stimulate protein synthesis because there is a threshold and I'm going to go on and talk about that. And that intake is somewhere between 0.25 to 0.55 grams per kilogram of body weight and we're talking high quality protein I'm going to come on and talk about that so that's 20 to 40 grams of protein is what you need in a meal to maximally stimulate protein synthesis and you can imagine how you could distribute that over the course of the day you're say your 40 grams into multiple meals to make your um, 246 grams requirement okay so that's what you require so now you know what you require you can see how we come to these different conclusions on this. So the first thing to talk about is what are proteins? Well, proteins are essentially just structural components of the body and they're made up of these things here called amino acids. And amino acids, this is a molecule right here. This is an amino acid. So we've got serine here and you can see they've all got the same basic structure. It's repeated over and over again, but they've got this difference in the side chain and that determines the function of the uh, amino acid. What happens with proteins is that they join together. So as you've got proteins joining together, you've got a single protein, that's an amino acid. You join two together, that's a dipeptide. You join three together, that's what you get called a tripeptide. And then you can join large um, sections of amino acids here and you get these things called polypeptides here. And you can see this is a long amino acid chain all stringy together. In total, you've got 20 amino acids that the body needs. Nine are considered essential, so you need to get them from the diet. 11 are non-essential. And a gram of these amino acids make up a protein, uh, and that's worth around about four calories. Well, it is worth four calories. You can have any number of infinite amount of amino acids. So you've got these long chains, they're joined together. Once these long chains join together, those side chains I was talking about, they'll interact with each other. That will cause the protein to bend over. Once enough of them are in a sequence, you start to get these um, tertiary structures. And then these structures themselves will interact with each other and you'll get these um, much larger quartary structures as, uh, as well. And incidentally, this is, uh, this is hemoglobin that you need within your, uh, your red blood cells to attract um, oxygen. These are your essential amino acids and your um, 
or indispensable amino acids. So you can see you've got them here. You can pause the video right now and you can go and have a look. The branched chain amino acids are your most famous ones. You've also got these indispensable ones whereby in certain conditions, you also need additional amino acids. So you can see arginine here, taurine, glutamine, uh, cysteine and tyrosine all needed at different stages. Histidine is needed um, if you're uh, a child as, as well, an essential amount. Role within the body, well, the proteins do everything, really. So most of you will be watching this video because you're interested in muscle. So proteins make up your actin and myosin filaments. They also make up your collagen and your tendons and um, ligaments. Um, incidentally, also making up the keratin within your hair and nails. They make hormones. They're making um, antibodies as well. So they've got an immunomodulating effect. They're making up um, hemoglobin within red blood cells, so they've got a transportation effect. This is a, a neuropeptide, so they've got signaling consequences in the brain. And actually, you've got over a million proteins circulating your blood, following, performing different functions. So very, very important, you can imagine, proteins for, uh, for your overall health beyond just simply muscle building. But if you want to build muscle, you need protein in your diet. Now, in terms of protein quality, this is, uh, this is important. There's different ways in which you can measure protein quality. And I've got a few different indices here. You've got something called the protein efficiency ratio. You've got the biological value and net protein utilization. And then you've got something called the protein digestibility corrected amino acid score or the PDCAA. And it really does depend on the different way in which you rate protein. So the protein efficiency ratio is, a, ratio is an interesting one. So if you feed a mouse um, a, a diet and the only protein source you give it is either beef, casein, egg, milk, peanut or soya, then these are gross growth rates of uh, a mouse compared to the, the reference. And, uh, and what you see is that when you feed the mouse um, animal source protein, then the mouse grows superiorly to, uh, to the vegetable source protein. You've also got the biological value. So that is whereby you're looking at the um, direct measurement of the nitrogen, that's that little atom within the amino acid, and how well that is um, absorbed from the food. So egg, it's 100%. When you look at vegetable-based sources, it's much more challenging for your body to absorb that from the um, vegetable-based sources compared to the animal-based sources. So you've got a difference there um, as well. There's also something called the PDCAA, as I mentioned already, and that's based on what the limiting amino acid is. So the limited essential amino acid and it's scored from there. So if you utilize a different um, metric for measuring protein quality, you get different um, proteins coming on top. But generally speaking, what you tend to see is that animal-based proteins are the best when it comes to um, protein scoring. So they've got the highest quality. So when I'm talking about um, high quality protein being recommended, we're really talking about the uh, animal-based proteins. Now, protein combining is important from vegetarian sources because very often um, what you see when you're looking at vegetable-based sources is you do have limited amino acids. So you've got amino acids which are in very small amount and if you were to um, consume just that one source, then you wouldn't get sufficient amounts of that amino acid. So here's an example of this. You can see grains, maize, um, most vegetables, soyas, uh, nuts and seeds are limited and things like liacine, methionine, uh, tryptophan, uh, liacine again. However, if you were to consume these particular vegetables alongside a complementary food, so good example here is grains, limited in liacine, but if you have the, the uh, legumes alongside it or the pulses and a meal like bean on, beans on toast, then you're not going to suffer from um, any sort of um, inadequacies in terms of the amino acids. So protein combining is, is important and very often most of us eat um, combined meals rather than just single sources by itself. So it's not really often an issue. Good sources of protein. If you're looking at protein in terms of grams um, per gram amount, per 100 gram, what you're going to find is animal-based sources typically have the, the highest protein amount. So, for example, you'd have to consume 200 grams of uh, soya to get 26 grams of protein compared to just, say, um, 100 grams of uh, fillet steak, which is grilled, and you still wouldn't get the same, same amount. So, you've also got to consider that the um, 
overall other macronutrient content of these foods. So you might have to consume a much higher fat content to get the same amount of protein over the um, over and above um, if you're eating a lot of vegetable-based sources, which can make managing diets really, really challenging. Um, but pause this video, have a look. You can uh, have a look and try and identify your, your favourite protein sources you're, uh, yourself. But generally speaking, again, it is meat and fish, dairy tends to come out on top in terms of the, the protein amounts. Um, good thing about cereals is there's a decent amount of um, protein in them and um, we often all consume rice, oatmeal um, as part of our, our diet and you can get a good amount of protein from this as well so you can combine it with um, your animal based sources. Now alongside the essential amino acids it's, it's worth mentioning these branch chain amino acids particularly leucine and if we take a, a muscle cell what we find is that um, if we do some exercise so that's your growth factor or your uh, hormone like um, insulin, it stimulates a protein within the cell and it tells the cell to start making more protein tissue. So you get larger muscle tissue off the back of it, provided stimulus is uh, sufficient. Um, once it comes to essential amino acids, if you consume enough leucine, it has the same direct effect on this mTOR pathway as well. So if you've got sufficient leucine in a meal, then you can maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis and maximize your, uh, your gain. So leucine is a very important amino acid. And if you were to take meals, which have got the same protein amount, so let's just say this is 20 grams, 20 grams, 20 grams, and 20 grams, because the amino acid content is different of these different protein sources, you see significantly different effects on the overall effect on muscle protein synthesis. Expressed here is something called fractional synthetic rate. So the leucine content and the amino acid content of the diet ultimately dictates the uh, effect on protein synthesis. And that's the thing which is ultimately dictating how well a mouse grows if you feed it um, a certain amount of um, protein. And this is a, a fact that's well known. If you feed a diet which is high in soya, for example, compared to one which is high in milk-based protein, you put people on a training study, the people that are going to take the milk-based protein typically do better than people that are having the, uh, the soya-based um, diet. Now, there are consequences for uh, dietary intake in terms of the effect on protein synthesis. So every time you have a meal, it tells your body to synthesize new protein, that effect of the meal wears off because protein synthesis can only be um, maximally stimulated for a short period of time because it's energy expensive. And you get this dynamic equilibrium takes place over the course of the day. You can see these are ours. Protein breakdown works in tandem with protein synthesis because we're always breaking down proteins for energy as well, remodeling and things like that. And generally speaking, what happens is you get a nice balance across the course of the day. However, should your protein uh, intake be sufficient and you implement exercise, this results in muscle protein synthesis outstripping muscle protein breakdown, and then you get the gains in muscle mass uh, as well, provided you've got enough calories in the, uh, in the diet. In terms of protein distributed across the course of the day, this is a famous study by uh, Arteta. This was replicated by Moore as well. And in this particular study, what they did was they fed 40 grams of protein twice as what they call a bolus dose, or 20 grams as four dosages, and then they fed 10 grams as uh, eight dosages over the course of the day, and then they measured muscle protein synthesis. Now, if you remember, protein synthesis is dictated by the amount of leucine that is in the, uh, the diet and the essential amino acids, and it looks like so long as you maximally stimulate protein synthesis, any more protein over and above that doesn't seem to make really much difference on overall muscle protein synthesis and that is where this classic 20 grams of protein or 30 grams of protein being the maximum amount your body can absorb or utilize comes from when you look at the, the data on this again looking at protein synthesis you can see that at one to four hours 46 hours and then six to 12 hours this middle graphic here and um, the intermediate intake amount so that's the four 20 gram dosages comes out on top and if you compare it over a 12 hour period, then you see more protein synthesis overall over 12 hours when um, you distribute your meal. So there is an argument for splitting up your protein intake over the course of the day rather than having it all in one single uh, single meal. Okay, so 
We're about done here with this uh, particular session. So I just want to have a, a quick summary on this. Um, proteins are made up of amino acids that form chains and uh, they make structures. There are 20 amino acids, nine of which are essential. Essential amino acids that play very important roles within the, the body. You also have the indispensable ones. Branch chain amino acids, uh, leucine in particular, that's a massively important one. That's a massive master regulator of protein synthesis. These proteins overall, they are the building blocks of the human body, so you need enough of it to build um, muscle mass. The quality of proteins can be determined by the amino acid content. Generally speaking, animal-based sources have got gram for gram a much higher protein quality, um, and they also tend to be lower in fat. And then higher quality protein diets are likely to build more muscle tissue than uh, lower quality protein diets. Uh, protein diet, uh, protein timing could be an important strategy to maximize muscle protein synthesis and it becomes more important uh, particularly as you go on diets to, to lose body fat. When you've got sufficient calories it probably doesn't matter as much but when you're in a calorie deficit it certainly does make uh, a difference. Okay so thank you very much for your attention if you have any questions then don't be afraid to just send me a message let me know what you think of this um particular seminar hopefully you find it useful be sure to check out my coaching page if you're looking into uh, to bodybuilding coaching or athletic pursuits check out my instagram that's fueled by scott soats and be sure to check out my bodybuilding organization the natural bodybuilding uh, federation which is the world natural bodybuilding federation united kingdom you can can uh, contact me on any of those sources or you can visit my website so you can also email me on there as well hopefully you find that useful guys i'm dr andrew chappelle and that was protein nutrition thanks peace